the early days of the 1800s in the U.S. hold a fascination for uh, modern Americans. Something about it remains in our minds. Maybe it's the rural nature of society then, or the pioneer spirit, or how tough life was compared to our life today, relatively speaking. Maybe it's the idea of no electricity, cooking over an open fire, of sitting in the living room after dinner, a room lit only by a lamp and Papa's glowing pipe as he tells stories. Some of those are ghost stories. That environment, that atmosphere lends itself to chilling thoughts of hauntings and ghosts and spirits, maybe sometimes demons. They were a very religious people. The indigenous people of the land, the Indians, had their own tales of shapeshifters and evil spirits. And it was this very world that tonight's episode comes from. I'm your host, Matthew Miller, expert in all things monster and paranormal. I'm a horror writer from the dark, haunted swamps of Louisiana, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to my horrifying world. Please check out my books on Amazon, beginning with Blood Feud, a punk rock vampire story. It's volume one in the Gravediggers series. The Gravediggers are a punk rock band who keep crossing paths with all sorts of evil creatures. It's horror, it's comedy, and one super entertaining series. It's a six-part series. One through three are already available on Amazon, Kindle, paperback, Kindle Unlimited. Volume four is coming out very soon, so be sure to stay up to date with volumes one through three. Tonight, I'm talking, of course, about the Bell Witch Haunting, one of the most famous, certainly the most bizarre poltergeist cases in American history. The Amityville horror, which I spoke of last time, is, is closer to us, more modern. But this one is really weird, the Bell Witch. It happened around Adams, Tennessee, on the family farm of the Bell family. The patriarch of the family, John Bell Sr., had his uh, wife and his children, and they lived there together on a farm. And this is one hell of a poltergeist case, to be honest with you. This entity has more personality than anything I've ever heard of, I think, or read of. So let me say from the start that the Bell Witch story is very complex. Several elements of the case are representative of known Southern folklore. And I'll talk about this later because, true or not, I personally feel that the Bell Witch haunting, uh, the story, is an important part of Southern folklore, you know, the zeitgeist of the time, the Southern and the American experience. And as a Southerner, it relates and resonates with me in many ways, in fact. The story begins with the Bell family, as I said, headed by John Bell Sr., who was born in North Carolina in 1750. He married Lucy Williams, who became, of course, Lucy Bell, daughter of farmers. And the Bells bought a farm in Edgecombe County, <clears throat> began becoming very successful, actually, uh, amassing wealth, gaining wealth. And then in 1804, the family decided to build a house and a farm on a thousand acres of land, this was near the Red River, and it, uh, it's in Robert, it was in Robertson County, Tennessee, where this happened. Now we have John Sr., the father. We have uh, Lucy Bell, the mother. And then we have the children, <clears throat> uh, Jesse, John Jr., Drury, Benjamin, Esther, Zadok, these are biblical names, Elizabeth, n nicknamed Betsy, Richard Williams Bell, and Joel Egbert Bell. So they build a house, uh, start a farm, and they're becoming pretty successful. The haunting canonically began in 1817. I'll give you the traditional story of the haunting, then I'll <clears throat> just kind of talk about the sources we have for it, and finally we'll take a look at what skeptics have to say. It's important to the story, uh, off the bat, to mention Kate Batts. Off the bat, her last name was Batts. <clears throat> Kate Batts was a neighbor of the Bells, and in that day in the country, a neighbor, you know, it didn't mean next door, it meant... Along, not too close, but somewhere near. She and John Bell Sr., and in fact, Kate Batts and her husband, Benjamin Batts, <clears throat> uh, they had fallen into a kind of feud with John Bell Sr. In 1816, John Bell agreed to buy a slave from the Batts. And yes, you know, we're talking about a time in American history where there was unfortunately chattel slavery, where people were traded like objects, but that's, just, that's what happened, you know. So John Bell agreed to buy a slave from Kate Batts and her husband, Benjamin there was a dispute about the price somehow, and John claiming he didn't receive the property. Kate Batts accused him of usury, which means charging excessive interest. And keep in mind that in those days, usury was a sin and a crime in that area. They were very, very religious people. So the church held a trial, 
uh, decided that John had actually done nothing wrong. But Kate Batts then sued him in civil court, and she won the lawsuit. This kind of made the church ashamed, brought shame on the church. So they excommunicated John Bell Sr. and never brought him back in. And this means that officially when the poltergeist case and the events began, John Bell Sr. was not uh, a saved Christian, If you know, just from the standards of, uh, of the religion of that time. He was considered an apostate. <clears throat> Kate Batts herself, she was a bit of an interesting character. She was kind of an outcast. And... She was poor. Her husband either died young or couldn't help with the labor, so she did most of it. And a lot of people in the area believed Kate to be a witch. She would always ask other women for pins, P-I-N-S, because, uh, well, we don't know why, but she had a habit of this. And a lot of women wouldn't do it because they believed that in those days that asking a pin from someone was a form of witchcraft that allowed the witch to control the person giving the pin. The popular account says that Kate Batts died and cursed John and swore to get revenge, but in reality, she lived longer than John. She outlived him, and there's no record of her cursing him like that. She always denied any involvement in the haunting, uh, but keep all Kate Batts in mind. The first incident, John Bell Sr. was out with his gun doing some hunting when he saw a large creature that resembled a dog, a big dog, but it wasn't quite a dog. It resembled a dog. The creature was staring at him, so he fired at it, and it just disappeared into thin air. Assuming that this was indeed the first incident in the haunting, it's unusual. You might, uh, it, it kind of reminds me of the shapeshifter legends of the local Indians, but what makes me believe that this was the poltergeist and not a traditional shapeshifter is that the events that followed were classic poltergeist events. <laughs> And, uh, and the entity did claim to be able to take on the form of animals. Also, poltergeists have proven again and again to uh, their ability to warp our perception of reality, uh, almost using it as a bragging method or to try to scare us. And so the idea that an entity could appear as an animal is not that far-fetched. Around that same time, Drew Bell, one of John's sons, Drew saw an unusually large bird-like creature sitting on a fence. It looked at him and flew off. <clears throat> you might think, well, what's the big deal? Father sees a wolf, son sees a bird. But keep in mind, though, that these men were self-sufficient farmers who lived tough lives in the wilderness. They knew the land. They knew the animals of the area. And these two animals were strange enough for them to note and to comment about. So something was weird about the animals. <clears throat> Again, around the same time, daughter Elizabeth, that's Betsy, saw a girl in a green dress hanging and swinging from a tree branch like playing somehow, but way up in a tree branch. Full-bodied apparitions this early in a poltergeist case are rare. Uh, keep in mind, though, that the family would have known of any little girl in the area. You know, these people knew everyone in the area. It was a, it was a farming community, and no random girl would have just been wandering around the wilderness, right? It's impossible. So something very strange. Now, as I mentioned, the Bells, like many people or many white people in the area, own slaves. Unfortunately, that's the historical situation, right? Um, I will mention that one of the Bell's slaves named Dean, he told the Bell's that when he was out walking at night, more than once, he was followed by this giant black dog. He said sometimes the dog had two heads, and sometimes it had no head. <clears throat> Keep in mind that uh, the black dog in, in a lot of medieval motif is a symbol of the devil. Dean also claimed that he once, that the entity once, turned him, Dean, into a mule, for a period of time. <clears throat> I don't know what to say about that. The next stage of the haunting is very classic poltergeist. The bells began to hear scratches and knocks in the walls of their house. That's the very classic beginning of a poltergeist case. Next, they heard dog-like sounds throughout the house. They heard the sound of an animal gnawing on their bed frames while, when they were in bed and there was no animal there. They heard the sound of dogs fighting when there were no dogs in the house. They heard the sound of flapping wings against the ceiling, as if a bird, a bird were trapped, but there was no bird. They also heard the sounds of chains being dragged on the floor. That's To me, that's almost comically stereotypical. You know, the old cartoons, <laughs> uh, 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 Warner Brothers cartoons, the ghosts are always dragging chains. That's just so stereotypical, but that's what they heard. And then this is really creepy. They heard the sounds of choking and strangling, of a person choking and strangling, but there was no one there. They heard the sounds of beds being tossed around, like, you know, tossed against furniture and walls, uh, slammed against each other, coming out of empty bedrooms. 
The children's bed sheets would be pulled off of them at night by unseen hands, especially uh, Betsy, Elizabeth. The entity chose her. Uh, you know that uh, in poltergeist hauntings, the entity often chooses one family member, sometimes two, to really torment and pick on. Well, it chose Betsy in this case. <clears throat> it's difficult to establish a very precise timeline for the Bell Witch haunting because the, the few sources focus on the phenomena more than the timeline. So for the rest of this, I'll just tell you, list the things that happen. Let me say first that, that the entity loved to torment Betsy, but not only her, but her father, John Sr. It hated John Sr., it truly hated him. But what's weird, it seemed to love Lucy, John's wife. It described her as, the quote, the most perfect woman to walk the earth, close quote. It told her news of her family back in North Carolina that was verified to be true. It brought her exotic gifts and fruits and nuts from around the world, things that don't grow in the area, that grow across the world. And they would sometimes just fall from the ceiling. When she got sick, the entity sang hymns to her very sweetly, sang church hymns. All right, so <clears throat> loved Lucy, hated uh, Betsy and John Sr. And keep in mind that probably hundreds of people visited the family during this, during this uh, event, during this occurrence. Uh, there are hundreds of witnesses to all this stuff. People came from far and wide to see this famous uh, haunting. So what would it do? What would the entity do? It would poke, pinch, and slap members of the family, especially Elizabeth. And it would also do this to neighbors and visitors. In fact, uh, some... People would come and didn't believe in the entity and say, okay, if you're here, prove to me. And they'd feel someone slap their face, <laughs> you know, as an invisible, invisible hand. It would engage in philosophical and theological discussions and debates with visitors and with the Bell family. This was a very intelligent poltergeist. It would cite scripture from the Bible to prove its point. And according to the sources, it would usually win the debate. It would attend church, apparently, <laughs> more than one church at once. It would sing during the church services. This is this disembodied voice. After church, it would go back to the bell house, repeat the sermons that it heard in the very voices of the preachers who preached them, word for word. It would tell the secret sins of local people, especially preachers. <laughs> you know, if they were living some kind of a secret life, he would tell everyone. As I mentioned above, it would bring like gifts, things like exotic fruit, nuts that could only be found in certain parts of the world. It would manifest them. Usually they would drop from this, the midair around the ceiling. So apparently it could travel great distances very quickly. This is a characteristic, of course, of demons, as we'll see later. It sang all the time. It loved to sing dirty drinking songs, body songs. It once apparently got into a local still house, a whiskey you know, still, got really drunk, and it sang dirty songs all night, kept everyone awake. <laughs> this is why I said it has personality, you know? Uh, William Porter was a family friend. He was staying at the bell house. He said the entity climbed into bed with him. He felt someone climb in. No one was there. Thinking quickly, he threw the bed sheets over the entity. And so, you know, like if you've seen a movie where there's a humanoid form under a sheet, you pull the sheet off and nothing's there. It's kind of like that. So he ha here he has the shape of the thing. He grabs it, wrestles it ac around the room, across the room to try to throw it into the fireplace. He said it was just too heavy and it just smelled too bad and he couldn't do it and it disappeared. The entity seemed to hate the family slaves and to torment them, pick on them. The entity, you know, once they got it to talk, it seems like it, they couldn't shut it up. It was, uh, it, it talked all the time. When it was asked who or what it was, it said a few different things at different times. It said once, quote, I am a spirit. I was once very happy, but I have been disturbed and made unhappy. I am the spirit of a person who was buried in the woods nearby and the grave was disturbed, my bones disinterred and scattered, and one of my teeth was lost under this house. I'm here looking for that tooth, close quote. That's creepy. Of course, no such tooth was ever found, and there were Indian burial mounds all around the area. People were buried there, but there's no evidence that, that this was true. Another time, it claimed to be, quote, Kate Batts's witch, close quote. Remember Kate Batts? John Bell had gotten in a feud with her. It claimed to be her witch. Uh, because of this, the Bells began to call it Kate, um, it's not uncommon to name an entity in, in these cases. It helps the people suffering from the phenomena to kind of humanize it a little bit, to maybe deal with it better. But it seemed to accept the name Kate with no problem, it seemed to like it. Yet another time, when asked who or what it was, it answered, quote, A spirit from everywhere, heaven, hell, the earth, am in the air, the houses, any place at any time, have been created millions of years, close quote. 
Was this perhaps the closest to the truth that it ever told? Another time, it claimed that it was the spirit of an immigrant who had buried a valuable treasure nearby. It said it wanted Elizabeth, Betsy, to have the treasure. It gave instructions there, and, and the men went and dug all day long, found nothing, and the entity laughed at them, called them fools for believing such a silly story. It's got a sense of humor, you know, to be honest. It's terrifying, but it has a sense of humor. John Bell Jr. had a special relationship with the entity. From the start, he decided he was not going to be afraid of it, but he was going to be confrontational. He told it that he knew exactly what it was and that he would never back down from it. And he would often forcefully accuse it of evil, call it names, uh, engage it in a debate. And he was the only family member that the entity left alone who didn't at some point mess with or torment. In fact, the entity said that John Bell Jr. was very intelligent and that it respected him gratefully, uh, greatly. So he stood up to it and it seemed to work. On one occasion, John Jr. asked the entity to touch it. Uh, it agreed it would shake his hand, but only if he swore he wouldn't try to grab it and pull it. He agreed, and the invisible hand shook his, and he said it felt cold. At one point, the entity, we'll call her now Kate, claimed, or it Kate, I don't know if it's a her, claimed that it had brought four other spirits into the house, and it named them Black Dog, Mathematics, Psychography, and Jerusalem. Some weird demonic names there, huh? Uh, so Kate's voice, now there's five spirits, supposedly. Kate's voice, they said, was feminine, refined. Black Dog's voice was feminine, but really harsh and gruff. Mathematics' voice and Psychography's voices were feminine and delicate. And Jerusalem's voice sounded like a young boy. Now, knowing how poltergeists very classically lie and deceive, I have no doubt that, but that this was the same entity just pretending to be these other four spirits. Elizabeth Bell and a local boy, Joshua Gardner, fell in love and wanted to get married. And Kate, the entity, absolutely did not want that marriage to occur. Did everything in her power to prevent it. She even harassed and tormented the boy, you know, would constantly, would never leave the two alone. The entity told Elizabeth that if she married Joshua, she would be very unhappy for the rest of her life. Elizabeth was worried that the entity would physically harm or even kill uh, Joshua, so, so she broke off the engagement. Joshua moved away, and instead, uh, Betsy married her former school teacher, Richard Powell. And lest that sound weird to you, uh, in that time and rural setting, in that place, in that area, in that you know, early 1800s, it was not uncommon for a school teacher to end up marrying his oldest student once she graduated. And yes, there was a, often a big age gap. That's just, that's just how it happened then. That would be frowned upon today, of course, but it wasn't, it wasn't then. The entity hated John Bell Sr., on one, uh, more than one occasion, it threatened to kill him. It, it swore it would kill him. Now, John Bell Sr. began having these, these incidents, these fits where his tongue would swell in his mouth. He couldn't talk. Uh, doctors had no explanation. Of course, medical science at that time was not extremely advanced, but yeah, his tongue would swell up. John Bell Jr., the entity, remember, liked him and respected him. He was planning a trip to North Carolina to take care of his deceased father's estate. Uh, the entity told him not to go, said, you'll be wasting your time, the estate's not settled, and you're not going to get any money. He went, and sure enough, she was right. He came back without any money. <laughs> Allegedly, General Andrew Jackson, who would later become the president, visited the Bell Farm because of the fame of the Bell Witch. Now, keep in mind, in the 1800s, early 1800s in the U.S., Tennessee, it's a very sparse population, right? Um, mostly farmers. So there's nothing unusual about a general stopping by to visit a farm he'd heard about. As he approached it, his wagon stuck, and it wouldn't move for no apparent reason. Jackson said to his men, quote, By the eternal, boys, it is the witch, close quote. And when he said that, a voice from the air laughed and said, quote, All right, general, let the wagon move on. I'll see you again tonight, close quote. And the wagon could go again. Uh, along with Jackson and his party, there was a man calling himself a witch layer, meaning like a witch hunter or ghost hunter. His name was Dr. Mies or Mise. He claimed also to be a wizard. And he had been bragging about how he would stop the Bell Witch, right? He knew exactly how to stop her. So the night that Jackson and his friends arrived at the Bell House, the witch layer, Dr. Mies, was in the, in the parlor waiting with a gun, you know, calling out the, the spirit. You know, if you're here, come here. I dare you to come. So finally they heard the sounds of footsteps in the room and the witch's voice saying, all right, here I am, and I'm, quote, ready for business, close quote. It told the witch layer, said, go ahead and shoot me. The gun wouldn't fire. He said, try again, and it wouldn't fire. 
Then they heard a slapping sound and the guy's chair flipped backwards. He stood up and began running around the room frantically, uh, uh, screaming that the witch had, was grabbing his nose and leading him by his nose. And then he ran out of the house and never to be seen again. And apparently Andrew Jackson and his men just almost collapsed in laughter at that. Now, it's said that there's no, not a lot of evidence that Jackson actually visited the, the house, but it's part of the account. You know, the, it's in the accounts we have, so I don't know. Uh, the entity claimed that it could take on any form it wanted, which makes sense, right? The black dog, the weird bird, the little girl. <clears throat> Besides John Jr., the witch did shake the hands of other men, and they had to swear that they wouldn't grab it. One man described the feeling, quote, like a woman's hand, close quote. Another said it felt hairy. One visitor to the house, John Johnston was his name, asked the witch to say something only he would know. He said, what did my Dutch step-grandmother used to say when her slaves did something wrong? The witch, in the, in the grandmother's voice, said, hut tut, what has happened now? Which apparently was what she would say. The entity called John Sr. Old Jack Bell, and remember she'd sworn to kill him. And as the tormenting uh, weighed on him, his mind, his emotions, he got really sick. And he uh, was bedridden. You know, he took to bed rest, basically, doctor's orders. On December 19th, 1820, John Bell Sr. failed to get out of bed. Uh, and John Jr. went to the cupboard to look for his medicine. And there apparently were three bottles of medicine. And when John Jr. looked, there was only one, and it didn't look like the medicine. It was full of this uh, supposedly dark and smoky liquid. The witch said, quote, It's useless for you to try to relieve old Jack. I've got him this time. He will never get up from that bed again, close quote. And uh, the little bottle of weird brown liquid, she said, quote, I gave old Jack a big dose of it last night while he was fast asleep, which fixed him, close quote. The men present gave the liquid to a cat to test it. And the cat immediately died. Of course, to me, that's cruel, but those were different times. So they threw the bottle into the fireplace. It exploded, and the fire turned blue. And sure enough, John Bell Sr. died on December 20th, 1820. As I said earlier, this is the only case I know of where a poltergeist actually killed someone. Even so, it didn't kill him directly. You know, it didn't strangle him with his visible hands or something. Instead, it tricked him. It switched out his medicine for poison. And you probably know, if you listen to this podcast, that I don't believe poltergeists are ghosts or spirits. I think they're actually demons or evil spirits. I don't think they're ghosts of humans. And so they seem somewhat limited in what they can do. Uh, Christians would say that God limits what they can do. Uh, he limits what they can do to harm us. Uh, I don't know what the case is. But again, um, a poltergeist here, even though the entity killed him, it didn't even do it directly. At John Bell Sr.'s funeral, the entity was there, speaking, acting drunk, singing dirty, drinking songs. Then after John Bell's death, it seemed that the entity had accomplished what it wanted to accomplish. The activity slowed down, and in 1821, the spirit told the Bell family it was leaving. So, okay, I'm going, I'm leaving, this is it, bye-bye, but I will return in seven years. And in February of 1828, apparently it did return with some some more p typical poltergeist phenomena, but it didn't stay long. The, the stereotypical, or the typical two to three months. It told the family it, were, it would return again in 1935 to haunt the Bell descendants, but there's no evidence that it did. The Bell uh, descendants say nothing ever happened. In the modern age today, people have reported paranormal phenomena in the area where the Bell farmhouse stood. There's also a cave near the area. There's a lot of caves in that area, but there's one called the Bell Witch Cave. And allegedly, electronic equipment acts up in the cave. Some people have claimed to take a photograph of a witch in the cave and so forth, but you never know, right, in those cases. Uh, pareidolia, you know, sometimes we see things that aren't really there because it's a pattern that looks like something we see. Like looking up in the clouds, a cloud looks like a dog, you know, because we know what a dog looks like, and our brain projects that pattern. <clears throat> Let's talk skepti skepticism for a moment. The main charge... Uh, by skeptics is about the sources for the account of the haunting. The main source is a book written by Martin V. Ingram, who was a newspaper reporter or editor. It's called The Authenticated History of the Bell Witch. And according to one of John Bell Sr.'s grandsons, the material was based on John Bell Sr.'s own journal. The exact location or the location period of that journal is not known today. Skeptics point to this as weak evidence. But to be fair, there are some contemporary accounts of the haunting. Some people living then 
uh, who wrote about it. I won't bore you by listing them, but they're there. You can find them online. If you watched the, the 2005 film An American Haunting, which was based on the Bell Witch case, you know one of the other theories about it, too. Uh, it, uh, this theory implies that John Bell Sr. was actually sex, uh, sexually molesting his daughter Betsy, that Betsy somehow psychically created the entity to deal with the abuse, to punish her father. And it's an intriguing theory. It goes into metaphysics and so forth, but there's no evidence that John Sr. abused his daughter at all. There's no evidence of that. Some folklorists have argued that the Bell Witch, ha uh, Bell Witch Haunting, real or not, is important Southern American folklore, that it represents many issues of the time. I, I thought about this a bit. Uh, I think it's true. The entity Kate is very much like the Br'er Rabbit character. And if you're not from the South or not familiar with Southern folktales, Br'er Rabbit is a trickster. Um, the concept of this trickster or the trickster spirit comes from African folktales that came to the New World with slaves. If you are familiar with Africa, French Africa, French-speaking Africa, you probably know Bouki et Lapin, right? The tricksters. Um, well, <clears throat> a trickster is an entity that is neither good nor evil. It's not moral and it's not immoral. It's rather amoral. It just doesn't have morals. It does things simply to amuse itself. It does things to humans that sometimes are good, sometimes are bad, depending on how we perceive it. The trickster character is its actually a very deep subject, but generally speaking, it represents nature and the world around us. Nature acts of its own will, right? We don't control nature. It doesn't care about its effects on humans. A tornado might destroy a house or it might pass by a house. It's, it's almost arbitrary. And then likewise, as humans, I believe we struggle with the part of us that is evolved and supposedly civilized and that part of us that is still very much an animal because we are animals. And the trickster, which, by the way, is represented by the green man motif in European folklore, it's that uncontrollable wild element of nature that comes into our lives, causes what seems like chaos and havoc to us, but really is just the way the world works, you know? Rural farmers in that area at the time would have definitely struggled against nature much more than we can imagine today, right? Their lives depended on it. And so this, uh, this trickster, Kate, can represent that, that the arbitrary... Um, wildness of nature. Another element of the story is the slave and master relationship. As you can imagine, slaves hated their masters, of course, and there were many cases of slaves poisoning their masters, especially in that time. Uh, in this manner, Kate could represent the will and the mind of the slaves. It was an entity that could do and say the things they wanted to, but weren't allowed to, couldn't. In fact, some scholars of the Bell Witch Haunting uh, believe that it was John Bell's slaves who actually poisoned him with cyanide, and there was no witch at all. All right, let's summarize this. The weirdest poltergeist experience I've ever heard of. The entire haunting lasted from 1817 to 1821, which is four years. Certainly not the longest ever, but longer than the average two to three months, which is how long a poltergeist haunting usually occurs. It included pubescent people, as most, most uh, cases do, especially Betsy. It bore many of the very common traits of a poltergeist haunting, the scratching, the objects moving, the voices, the lying, the false claim of who the entity is, and so forth. Probably a hundred people or more uh, witnessed the phenomena overall. And if we're just Elizabeth faking it all, she must have been the most talented ventriloquist and stage magician in the history of the world, which is why I don't think she was faking it. That would have been impossible, especially in front of so many witnesses. In my opinion, that's all this is, it bears the traits of an authentic poltergeist haunting. In the 1800s and early rural America, I really uh, doubt, and I can assure you, that farmers like the Bells were not paranormal experts, didn't even know the word paranormal, I'm sure, hadn't even heard of poltergeists. How would they have known all of these typical things to fake? They couldn't have. If indeed Kate was a real entity, then, in other words, if the story's true, there's little doubt in my mind but that she was a demon, or an evil spirit of some kind. Uh, she could be anywhere in the world in an instant, even two places at once. She knew things about people that no one else could know. She knew the Bible backwards and forwards. She caused misery, pain, suffering, eventually death. She wasn't bound by the laws of nature and could actually bend the laws of nature. She could appear in many forms. In other words, everything about her uh, is, is the personality, the characteristics of demons. And what do you think? The Bell Witch Poltergeist Haunting is definitely one hell of a story, even if you don't believe it. You should, you should definitely read the authentic, uh, sorry, the authenticated history of the Bell Witch. It'll keep you up for a few nights, trust me. 
Real or fake? Invented legend? Historical fact? Let me know what you think in the comments. Also, very quickly, people have asked, what shirts do I wear in this podcast video? You can often see the top of them. I like to wear the shirts of bands that I like. This one is Five Cent Freak Show, which is a horror punk slash psychobilly band, if you know that genre. They're fantastic. You should check them out. But I usually wear different shirts of bands uh, that I like. And I like punk rock, classic punk rock and modern stuff, horror punk. I like all sorts of music, but those are the t-shirts I wear. One last thing I was going to mention, uh, as you know, I moved the Fangs and Folklore studio to this abandoned castle that I found in the middle of the forest. And, you know, in this dungeon room, the acoustics are really good. I just, I'm not sure what's on the wall there, but uh, I've been hearing uh, strange things, like footsteps from panting from, from somewhere else in the castle. The other night I heard this un unearthly, unnatural howl from the forest, and I was, uh, w wait, what is that? I think I, I think I hear. Oh, oh.